Let me open us in prayer before we get. Let me open us in prayer. And we won't make it through chapter one. Okay. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for these that come to listen. Lord, I pray again that today wouldn't be facts out of your word, but things that we can apply to our lives and skills that we can learn to better serve you. Lord, I'm sure that, that coming through the door today and maybe even over uh, Facebook, there'll be people, Lord, with problems and challenges, difficulties that we can't even imagine. Lord, I'm even reminded of one that I know that has had a real tough week. God, I pray for her. I pray for her husband that you would speak to both of them of where they are in life, about what they should do. Thank you for the excitement of today. Lord, I pray for Brother Richie. Lord, I pray that everything that he says in the aftermath of this would come straight from his heart and straight from you so that we could be changed. Thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, just a couple of quick little footnotes from uh, last week. We, uh, I introduced to you some things that you already know from the book of Ephesians. There's some words there, some churchy words, predestination. There's some doctrinal words, election. I ask you to turn to Psalms chapter 68. I never made a reference to it. I sat down and I could kill myself. I never made a reference to it of how that tied into last week's lesson. And so just as a very quick, quick, quick review to get us up to speed, how many of you, this is your first time from the book of Ephesians? Anybody in here that is like that? Good, good. So you're kind of up to speed in that Ephesians is divided into two parts, doctrine or the blessings of life and duty or the responsibilities that go along with being a Christian. And so once you realize the blessings that it comes, and I got news for you, next week we're going to see the past, present, and future of Christians for their blessings in chapter 2 that will just go along with this. But once you realize the blessings that come with the package of salvation, it's not a duty in the sense of, oh, can you believe we got to go today and do so and so and so and so? You've all been that way. Because there's some responsibilities of life and you just do them because you have to. No, sir. When you realize what Ephesians has to say, it's a want to. It's a I can't wait to. And so that's the difference that we're exposed to in Ephesians. And so we've been in the uh, section here in chapter 1. You know, uh, I mentioned this, that one of Dewey's, uh, not Dewey, one of Richie's isms, so to speak, is the heart of the passage, the heart of the passage. And if you think about chapter 1, you will miss this, and I've divided it into three little parts here that, uh, and, but you, you, you would miss this because nowhere will you find in your Bible the word Trinity mentioned. You think about that for a second. The word Trinity, to my knowledge, is not mentioned in the Bible, but do any of y'all have any problem believing that God has a Trinity? No, because you take that by faith. And you know, the, can I explain it in great detail? Well, huh, probably not. Can I imagine that God has three individuals that are one person? I don't understand totally, but I accept it by faith that there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they're all he's, I hate to tell you, for you uh, gender uh, appropriate people. Uh, 
sorry if that bothers you, but that's the way it is. And that's the way God uh, set it up. But last week, we spent a little bit of time in the first part here. And let me just read. I said last week that this is the longest sentence in the New Testament. And it is. And so... Uh, you can start out in chapter 1, verse 1, put your name there where Paul's name is uh, because the gospel message is personal. It's to you. And uh, so Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints, that's us, by the way, and them who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be to blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And so there's an abundance of blessings. You just got to remember, He didn't leave any out. It's not like God says, "Uh oh, don't." I should have talked to them last week about election. I forgot it. I forgot to refer to Psalms chapter 68, which don't let me forget. Uh, so, anyhow, God did not uh, forget one blessing in store for you and for me. And so he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing and they're found in heavenly places. You know, if you think about heaven, there's some good things there. So you know these blessings are good because they're promised by God. And then it says concerning us uh, in chapter 1, verse 4, and this is all has to do with the first part, is that we are saved by the will of God. He planned all of this out in advance. God the Father planned all this. And I don't know about y'all, but it blows my, chapter 1, verse 4, blows my mind. And look at what it says. Just as he chose us in him, that's Christ, before the foundation of the world. Now some people get all confused and mixed up by, here, by this terminology here about the doctrine of election predestination it's it's a big thing um, but in my little simple uh, analogy let me try to put it in a in a in a mindset and terminology uh, you know I said I graduated from college praise the Lottie not summa cum laude okay so school was came hard for me but I did meander my way through and got my four-year degree in five years. And so uh, I'm glad to get it, all right? So let me put this terminology, these two terminologies, and try to paint you a word picture of what chapter 1, verse 4 says, because it says a lot, and it's all good. It says... He chose you, if you profess to have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, He chose you. You don't just get saved when you just get a whim and decide that you're going to join the club. It's a calling, just like in verse 1 where He calls Paul by name. He reaches into your pit of hell your life and extract you. There is a calling. And I'm going to tell you something. When God calls you, you ain't got a chance. That's the, that's the cool thing. It's not a, just a flippant, but God extracts you. So let's, let's look at what these two terms here, because verse 4 ties to verse 5, and then we're going to get into today's lesson. Okay? Just as he chose us in Christ, in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, that's set apart, okay? That's what you should be. He wants us to be set apart. 
and without blame. You ever been blamed for something? And most of the time, if we're just being honest, when we're blamed, you know, guilty is charged, okay? But this is the opposite of that. God wants to look at you, and he wants to take you and set you apart, special, and then he wants to clean you up so you can be blameless. And guess what? You've got to be that way before you can get in his presence. And the only way you can do that is through the blood of Jesus Christ covering your sin. You cannot get in his presence any other kind of way. And so if you want to count your blessings today, count that as one at the top. Do you realize that? You can go straight to the guy that laid the foundation of this world just like that. That's something to be proud of. Verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as the sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to his good pleasure. I like that term. You know, you ever been to a restaurant and they say, uh, no, it's my pleasure to serve you. It's my pleasure. Think about that. This is God Almighty speaking to us and saying, look, it's my pleasure to serve you. It's my, it's, it's all out of the goodness of my heart. And so the idea here of predestined, you know, when I said this last week, do you think they're ever going to finish four lane and 79 out here? I'm sure we'll be glad because coming back and forth to Panama City, it sure wouldn't make it a little quicker. But anyhow, they didn't just start pushing dirt out there. See, what they did, they predestined that road in advance. They laid it out in advance. You see all these little stakes sticking on the road, ribbons tied around them? That's telling them where to go, the elevation to be, what, what to do. And so God, in his infinite wisdom, before he ever put a star in the sky, is what this is saying, he laid this plan out, he predestined this plan out in advance. He saw you. Now look, if that can't make your spiritual desires get a little bit excited, because look, I know me. I am wicked. I think bad thoughts. I mean, I can polish myself up and come in here and act real holy roller on Sunday. But look, I struggle through the week. I, I, the, uh, <laughs> Monday, this past Monday, I was thinking about church and so excited about us being a part of this church. I was thinking about Brother Richie's lesson. Myra and I had something kind of cool happen to us in a good way. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take the rest of the day off. And I'll see you after a little while. I'm just going to cut out today. That was at 1 o'clock. The minute I said that, it was like, I have to be on the Internet as I work in the field. The Internet and my truck went out. I was waiting on a call to meet a guy. He's trying to call me. I got GM on the phone trying to fix the internet in my phone. This guy's waiting on me. Another customer calls me. Hey, I got water dripping from my ceiling of my brand new house. And so, guess what? About 7.30, I rolled in at the house. And so, just remember, I am still in this world. God <laughs> has a plan. And look, so, somebody read the Psalms that I mentioned last week, and I'm thinking it was 68 about 19. I'm hoping. Please, Lord, let me be right. Somebody read Psalm 68, 19. Yeah. And what's the last phrase? 
In my version, which would be New King James, which doesn't matter, blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. So look, I'm reminding you again and again and again, it's God that planned the salvation part. And you ever wonder, I'm just throwing this in, no extra charge for what I'm about to tell you. You ever wonder why in the book of Psalms, I heard this, I didn't make this up, I heard this, so I'm stealing this, but it's cool. You ever wonder why that little word Selah is there in the book of Psalms? Does your version have that? Did it say that? Look, let me put it, y'all didn't know I could speak Greek too, so I'm going to put this in the Cliff Myers Greek. <laughs> Richie would kill me. Okay. This is all in jest. But I like this. When you read this, blessed be the Lord who daily loads you with benefits. Now you think about that. Never runs out. He's loading you up with benefits. The God of our salvation. So he planned that. And so the word selah after that, if you did it in the Greek by Cliff Myers, you'd say, how about that? How about that? You know, God daily loads you with benefits and expressions in life. He wants the very best for you. He has all these things picked out. He planned this in advance. So I got to shut up and move on. So that's pretty much what we forgot last week. And so now we move in to the second part of this lesson where the benefits kind of change and don't lose sight of the height of the passage, the fact that God planned our salvation in advance. It was uh, his plan to do that. And so we're also saved by the will, by the work of the Son. It was his purchase, not ours. Now think about that. You are, that's a blessing. The fact that God planned this. Now I'm sure it didn't go this way, but in heaven there was a discussion. Uh-oh, not uh-oh as in surprise. Man is going to fail, and we got to have a volunteer. Anybody volunteer to go back down there to earth now that it's all marred by sin? And so Jesus, God's son, said, take me. Just volunteer. Nothing you did for it. He volunteered, and so it's laid out here. But don't, don't, uh, don't notice that in between each of these three sections, the fact that God the Father purposed all this, God the Son worked it out, and we're going to see what God the Holy Spirit does in this. At the end of each of those sections, and they're in... Uh, at the end of verse 6, it says, to the praise and glory. So it's as, as if Paul has a little Pentecostal fit in the middle of each of these sections, and he just can't contain himself. He's so excited. He's, he's just blown away as God speaks this to him, and he pins it for, the book, for those people that he has ministered to in Ephesus, from jail. I mean, just put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> From jail, God planned it, organized it, and put it into being. And so, um, let's move on here. One of the hardest things that I find as I share my faith to people that have a clouded past, and we all have that, we all got baggage, but one of the hardest things for people to accept that have a real clouded past is the idea of forgiveness. And so look how he, Paul, and this is a reminder to you, this is a reminder to you, in verse 7, 
in him, now we're changing gears, we're talking about Jesus Christ, so don't lose sight of that. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. And so when you look at this, the term is a real churchy term, redemption. And people throw that term around and for new Christians to really grasp. Anybody got a good definition of what redemption means? Any thoughts? Paid in full. Paid in full. That's a good that's a great one. Anybody else? Bought back. Bought back? You know, it's the idea, look, think about this salvation thing. It didn't cost you a dime. It's as if you were given... You won the lottery. Yeah. <laughs> it's as if I reached into my pocketbook here and I said, here, whatever it cost, don't worry. You can run the bill. And by the way, take care of those past ones before you take care of the forward ones. Paid in full, that's what the idea of redemption carries. And so that's a blessing here. God has redeemed us, and it says he has forgiven us of our sins. Now look, that's where a lot of us, I can forgive you as long as you don't do it again. And guess what? The first time you remotely get near that forgiveness, that out of bounds, what do I do? I bring up your past. I bring up your past. I remind you of all the things where there's been a dilemma in the book of Psalms, it also says that he separates our sins as far as the what? East is from the west, never to be remembered anymore. Now, this is a blessing that was purchased by God the Son. That's what this is saying in this verse. What did it cost him? His life. He paid for it with his own blood. You can't, you can't do anything uh, to grasp it. It's as if you were a slave to sin and God bought you out of the slave pit and polished you up, forgave you, for, for, forgave you, forgive, forgave, whatever. He forgave you of your sin. And look what it says here in verse 7. According to what he had left over in the bank. Is that what it says? It says according to his riches of his grace. And so look, he's got an abundant supply. But let's go back and capture really. Have you ever wondered why when it says your sins are separated as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered anymore. Why does it say east and west and not north and south? Anybody know? That's great. That's an engineer for you. That's an analytical brain for you. Look, let's just go see my daughter in Asia today. <laughs> Myra and I would go. You start out, look, you head west. You keep going to California, you're headed west. West never meets east. When you head west, you're still going west. So look, this is what I explain to people all the time, all the time. I'm going to use you as an example. This is the book of your... Uh-oh, I'm supposed to be behind the thing, but tough. <laughs> this is the book of your life. And you know what? 
there's some things in this book of your life, and you know, you turn over here to this page, and you think, man, that was a great day. Those were good things recorded. And you keep turning over here, and you say, mm, can we forget that? Can we push that back? You turn over, uh-oh, it's worse. And you get to the day that you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, the work that he did on the cross, you are forgiven. Your sins are separated as far as the east is from the west. So listen, and look what it says, never to be remembered again. So look, when I was a little boy, you, I got in trouble with my parents for something. And I knew I was going to get in bad trouble. And I knew my daddy was going to kill me. Because my best friend and his daddy played golf. My, his daddy and my daddy played golf together every Thursday afternoon. And so earlier in the week, my friend Tim had got caught doing something that I was doing with him that I shouldn't have been doing. And I knew Tim's daddy, because he already knew it, was going to tell my daddy. And so guess what? It was going to be bad on Cliff. So to take the lesser of the punishment, I knew it was coming no matter what. You know, my parents weren't the type, hey, it's going to be all right. <laughs> Wasn't going to happen. I went in, I called my daddy Papa, said I got some bad news to tell you. Now look, this was in the days, and it doesn't matter what I did. I'm going to leave that off. I'm going to leave it a mystery. But in that day and time, what my, what my uh, vice was, well, who cares? What my vice was, we had smoked a little marijuana. And look, back in that day, if you smoked a little marijuana, you might as well rob the bank. <laughs> you, look, so I go in and I tell my daddy, and all this is the purpose of being forgiven. I got a reason for telling you this. Because we're going to put this into application. I went in, and look what it says here. Where am I? In whom we also have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to his riches of his grace. And so forgiveness for you and I, when you invite Jesus to come into your heart and save you, when you go into the presence of God Almighty and you say, I have made a muck of my life, please forgive me, Lord. Thank you for saving me. You know what he does? He separates your sins as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. So look, you turn from that page where it ain't so good to guess what? Clean. Clean. Look. So Satan, your number one accuser, says, you didn't really mean that. And you say, yeah, I did. And he says, well, what about your past, all the stuff you've done? See, so he's your number one accuser. You know what you can do to him? Because God says, look, let's see if I can find that day in my record book. So he turns to the book of your life, and guess what? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you can't even find it. No record of it. So quit dragging around your past. That's what that verse of Scripture says. And all of us, if we're honest in here, got a past. <laughs> My daddy, oh yeah, that's, I, I should go back to that. Yeah, he did kill me. Almost. <laughs> but he was wise enough, which ties into the next verse. Because I had a wonderful daddy. Ties into the next verse. He said to me, Cliff, now, I did tell a little fling flong in here. Got to admit. He said, are you sorry you got caught? 
are you sorry you are you really sorry? Oh, I'm, I'm really sorry. You know, like, <laughs> just don't kill me. <laughs> See, I'm sorry I got caught. But God used that in my life. And, and of course, I gave the church the answer. Oh, yes, I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Been there, hadn't you? And my daddy said to me, you remember this, wherever you go, God goes. You profess to be a Christian, Cliff? Yes, I do. You cannot escape his presence, whether I'm there or not. So wherever you go, he's seeing everything you're doing. And I'm going to treat you in this affair just like God. If you are truly repentant, if you truly have asked God to forgive you of this sin in your life, I'm going to forget it, and I'm never bringing it up again. Now listen to me. And of course, then he, you know, gave me the warm hand of fellowship to my rear end. <laughs> Hot hand of fellowship to my rear end. You know what? Till his dying day, he never brought it up. Because salvation, let me tell you what salvation will do for you. Look how it ties in here. It says, look in verse 8. Wherein, hath, wherein he, that's Jesus Christ, hath abounded to us in all wisdom and prudence or understanding. You see what? When you get saved, God begins to turn a light on. And if you're truly, truly, can you just imagine how much wisdom or content is contained right here in God's word? So look, it even gets better. Wisdom carries the definition and the idea of to know what truth really is. You see, for a while you can claim ignorance. <laughs> but after you become accountable, when I read God's word and it finds lodging in my heart, listen, some of y'all can get away with more than I can. <laughs> because guess what? I got years of experience here under my belt. And so... I always use this as an example. Hey, Cliff. This is the Holy Spirit. You ought not to do that. And so, as, as we're going through life here, God's wisdom is given to us, and it's an, it's an understanding to know what truth is. And so... If you look in the book of James, it also says this in the first chapter about wisdom. That he loves to give it. He loves to give it liberally. And guess what? He won't scold you for asking for it. So every time you go back to the well to ask for more and more wisdom, don't be shy. Don't be like you give your kids $5. Well, you probably have to give them 20 now. Go to the store to do so-and-so. Get, you know, go eat lunch, whatever you're going to do. And then you come back to your mom and dad later and you say, hey, I need 10 more. And they ask you, your parents ask you, well, what would you do with the 20 I just gave you? See, in God's warehouse, the Bible says he upbraideth not. He won't scold you for asking. And so, not only has he given us wisdom, he's given us understanding, it says there in verse 8, which is the fifth blessing. And so, listen to this. You just see things differently when you get your relationship with God Almighty in line and Jesus Christ pays the price. You accept all this and so look, understanding is the ability to see day-to-day -day problems 
in a different light. And if you don't believe me, just try it. Immerse yourself in God's Word. See, this isn't something that you're just going to think through and become better. No. As you read and become accountable for God's Word and what's in here, then He's going to increase your wisdom. You're going to see all life totally different. That's what this verse says. That's a blessing. That's a promise from God. Aren't you glad you aren't what you used to be? Amen. I mean, listen. <laughs> you, Blessing number six. Now, Mac and I had a discussion about this. This is a cool verse. Somebody read verse six. Please. Verse 6 or 9 and 8. Oh, did I say 6? I did. See? Y'all have to keep me straight. Let's, let's go with 9. Go ahead. Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. There's a term there that some of you might have in your Bible that is the mystery of his will. And look what it also says. It sounds like it's a contradiction here. Making known, it says. If you make known something, it ain't a mystery. So you might read this and you think, huh. So look, let me put it in the Cliff Myers Greek vernacular where I can get it. Having made known unto Cliff, so look, at the point of salvation, Jesus Christ made known unto Cliff the mystery of his will. It's not a mystery in the sense of a mystery novel of whodunit. You see, you ever heard that verse of scripture that says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit because they're spiritually discerned? That verse means... When you talk to a person that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, they might ask you a question like this. Cliff, you go to church every Sunday? <laughs> I mean, you know, it once a month, doesn't that do it enough for you? What, what do y'all do down there? You ever had? You're going to Grace Group again? I mean, you know, what in the world? See, the natural man doesn't really understand and see what goes on in the inside of these walls. It's Jesus Christ when he illuminates your heart. There are, this, this is what this term means, the mystery of his will. There's some spiritual terms and some spiritual principles that God alone has locked up. Not in the sense to hide them from you but in the sense to expose them to you. He wants you to know. And so listen, that's why we don't have to worry what's going on in the news. And listen, I need to be reminded of that because I'm a news junkie. I've had to turn it off. I can't take it. I just absolutely can't take it. But according to God's plan here, it says that he's made the mystery of his will, get, here's this term again, according to his good pleasure. It's God's good pleasure to bless us and expose you out of his word. And so look, he even tells you in the next phrase what the mystery of his will is. Look what it says. Here's another churchy word. Verse 10. That in the dispensation, that's a churchy word. What, did, what would dispensation mean? Plan. Plan. A period of time. A plan. So that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one, all things in Christ, both that are on heaven or in heaven 
and both that are on earth. So listen, he thinks enough of us as Christians to expose us to the mystery of his will, which is really not a mystery. And so he has unlocked that for us to see. And so we know how all this is going to end, both on heaven and earth. You see, going back to the first part of this lesson, God the Father planned all that. He needed the second part of the Trinity to work that out. So God the Son did the work through redemption by his blood. He paid the price, called you out of the sin pit, gave you forgiveness, and the forgiveness is permanent. Now look at this. I want to show you something because now we're to the very best part. I got 10 minutes to do it. And I brought you, anybody know what this is? I told you last week. It's, it's, a, it's a seal. So look, if you don't mind me, That is the corporate seal for my company. See the little, now this, this is just an example. I just brought it. I happen to be a little bit in the real estate business and construction. So here's how you do. And I'm explaining this just so you can, here, I'll give you your stuff back. How many of you think you can go buy something in real estate and you just, these days, somebody's coming to look at your house and I, let's pick on Al. Al, I'm coming to buy your house. And let's say Al's, I'm just pulling this out of the air. Al's got a house that's listed for $5,000. And Oak Cliff comes to look at it and says, you know, Al, I want your house. I, I want to buy it. And so Al says, well, what's the offer? And I said, well, I'll pay you full price. I'll pay you five grand. And so Al says, okay, you know, well, let's form a contract. So we write up a contract. We got the contract. What's your deposit? Uh, I, I, I'll give you 10 cents. You know what Al's going to say? Uh-uh, because I'm not about to take my house off the market for 10 cent, because what's 10 cent to you? <clears throat> Nothing. And so look, you want it to cost me something. So what if I said, to, I, this is a what if example, because I'm getting to the explanation. What if I said, Dale, I'll tell you what, I'll give you $4,999 today. What's the odds that I'm going to close that house? Pretty doggone tootin' good. So look. Remember this. And look how he reviews in verse 13 and 14. He reviews the salvation experience again because now we're to the third part of the Trinity, how we're saved by the witness of of the Holy Spirit and look at how the Holy Spirit is presented here y'all do y'all remember when Jesus went was about to go away and he had the disciples and they were still dumbfounded and he said look tarry here a little while until you have the power of the Holy Spirit y'all remember that in the New Testament yes See, he gave them a promise. So this is how we know this is true. Because, look at what verse 13 says. In whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also you believed. Hey, hey. What's that next phrase say? You were sealed sealed so the point of your salvation 
God thought enough of you in the beginning stage before the foundation of the earth, before he ever put a star, he saw Matt Myers, Katie Dollar, you, and at the point of your salvation, this verse comes into play. You see, verse 13, there's three phrases there. There's a heard, there's a believe, there's a trusted. You know what? You hear the gospel message, you believe it, and then you trust it for yourself. He just reviews the simple gospel message right there in verse 13. And then look. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That is the promise that, Al, if I give you $4,999, you've got a pretty good promise. I'm coming back to buy your house for five grand. Jesus Christ came, paid the price, with his own blood. And so at the point of salvation, God the Father that planned all this said, here Mac, here Katie, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit as the deposit, the guarantee that one day, that's the seal, I'm going to come back and claim ownership of you. That's the, that's the reason you don't have to sweat how this is going to end. Now, you, there's some things that you probably do need to sweat. But this isn't one of them. In Luke 24, 49, it says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. And so look, God the Father has promised that he would send the Holy Spirit, and look at what verse 14 says, which is the earnest money, I injected that, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Oh, you mean this comes with an inheritance? You know, have you ever seen people, they just can't wait for somebody to die? I know this isn't probably no, political correct. <laughs> They can't wait for somebody to die hoping that, guess what, I'm going to get a little something. You know, they're going to leave me a bunch of something in their will. I'm going to get it. Praise the Lord, I can get out of hock. And they get in there in the little attorney's office and they find out, uh-oh. Uh-oh, that's right. <laughs> there's no money. Or they left them out. You see, in God's plan, well, he has the keys to everything. <laughs> so as a child of his, there's an inheritance. And that inheritance is to be with him. No sickness, no health, no cancer. <laughs> and look how Paul ends this and we're done. Almost. It's as if he can't stand it again. He says, to the praise and glory of his grace. So I kind of put this in my own words, and I'm going to read it to you. If I'm just counting my blessings this week, God the Father thought, and it's just, it's just, just if you just read through these verses, I was sitting in Moffat this past week. Myra couldn't even get in the building. They immediately, they didn't want her in there at all. So I found myself just sitting there on a bench by myself. I took my little Sunday school stuff and I thought I'll just do a little study in here. I knew I was gonna have to wait. As I sit there, I see real sick folks. And it's serious in there. So I began to think, okay, how can I put all these blessings into my vernacular? And this is what I came up with. God the Father thought up our plan of salvation in advance. 
It was an organized plan and required no changes along the way because it was totally as he purposed it to be. As his dear children, he came up with a list of blessings for us straight out of heaven. The plan. Hmm. The plan happened before he ever created a star or a fish. You see, he had me in mind. To be able to accomplish his goal, I got to be free from dirt and filth of this world. So his plan was predestined in advance, laid out because he did not ever want us to be separated from him because he wanted to adopt me into his family. And so that I could be a member of his household. All of this was planned strictly in accordance with his will. It's mentioned three times, by the way. To be fully executed and accepted as his beloved children in his family. And if we elect on our own free will his plan, then we're fully accepted. Let me go back and capture one quick thing. Please forgive me. The doctrine of election and free will. Let me give you a simple analogy how that works. You see back over there? Right where the Richie's sitting. What does it say above that door? Exit. Let's just say for the, the explanation of election that Cliff Myers is in here by himself for the first time. I'm nervous and I see over there. See, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that who so ever will. See, there is a free will. So I'm in this building for the first time. I'm a little scared. And I'm wondering, should I go through that door or not? And so I make the decision and I scope it out. I look around and I walk over to the door and, you know, I knock. Nobody answers. I don't know what's behind the door. I'm scared to death. Should I? Should I not? Is there a wampus cat behind there going to shoot me? And so I finally, I, wampus cat, that's a southern term. Y'all know what that is. You don't want to meet a wampus cat. So I go through the door, and I look, and it's all different. And you know what? When I read the back of the door, you know what it says? What verse 4 says? chosen from the foundation of this world. That's what the doctrine of election is. It's my own free will to step through the door. If I do, I'm guaranteed all this. So let me finish. All this couldn't happen because there was a cost involved and the price would be expensive. God sent his own son who was willing to take on the challenge to purchase all our baggage full of sin. You see, I found I could charge all my fees to an account that was unlimited and there was no way I could contribute toward the balance that I'd already run up in advance. The treasure to pay the price for me was with his own blood. And then after accepting the transaction, my eyes were totally open to what was ahead. My mind could then be at rest. I had peace in my life and contentment. that I couldn't find words to adequately explain. I found an abundant supply of forgiveness, cleansing, wisdom, and was learning new ways to advance myself and my walk with him. I gained more understanding and began to see all of life in a different way. Jesus Christ began to open up and show me new secrets about life as I grew day, day by day. Now I am trusting in him, and he is showing me a long-range plan for both me and and how I fit into his plan on heaven and earth. To my surprise, his plan included an inheritance for me that I could never imagine. It came with a guarantee that I would receive it because he marked me as special with his seal of approval after he paid the down payment with his own life's blood. 
He left part of his life here inside of me as a promise to come back and get me. All you can say to that is, praise the Lord. <laughs> Next week, we're going to move on to, hey, I finished. Next week, we're going to move on to chapter 2. And there's two parts of chapter 2. The, the first part, now we're on the doctrine side, and I'm not going to do next week's lesson this week, but just look at the first half of that chapter. Look at your past. Look at your present. Look at your future. So that's what we'll do. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. I see some of my grace group uh, members not that y'all aren't special too but that's extra special to me so uh, Jerry why don't you close us in prayer See you in a second.